Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the talk. My name is Karan, and I'm a data scientist in the uh, AI Center of Excellence at Red Hat. Uh, so let me start by giving you a brief overview of what we're going to talk about. So first, I'll briefly mention like, some of the challenges that we face with data storage at scale. Uh, then I'll mention uh, one possible way in which machine learning can help mitigate some of these issues. And maybe the title of the talk gives away what this way is. Uh, then I'll show you a brief demo on how you can use the failure prediction stuff today, because all the stuff that I'm going to talk about today is upstream, and you can check out all of that. And finally, um, I'll talk about how uh, the open source community that you guys can get involved in the project. So uh, what was the motivation for this project? Uh, just by a show of hands, how many people here are data scientists? Anyone? No? Engineers? Software engineers? All right. Um, architects? OK, sweet. So uh, how many people work on uh, getting something useful out of data or provisioning data for others to use? OK, some. Uh, so essentially, the thing is, most projects these days involve around doing something useful out of data and uh, <clears throat> making it efficiently available to others. So, and these projects usually involve a lot of data. And because data is so central to these projects and because it, it can literally drive like, company decisions, you want to make sure that this data is uh, not corrupted and not lost. So with that in mind, most of the storage solutions like Ceph or maybe some variants of RAID, they use replicas or redundancies to ensure that you get that kind of fault tolerance. But when you're dealing with data that is at a large scale, like hundreds of terabytes or petabytes and beyond, then doing this can get really inefficient or maybe even expensive. So the idea was, instead of that, is it possible to monitor the state of our hardware somehow and then uh, identify by some sort of magic that, hey, now is the time when something is going to go wrong? And then based on that information, you proactively add another redundancy to uh, basically solve the problem before it even occurs. So when you would do that, you'll get a bunch of benefits. Like you'll have a more efficient resource utilization because you'll only use storage as and when needed. Uh, you'll have an increase in the fault tolerance because uh, the, the probability of losing data is generally related to uh, all of the machines failing. And if you add one more uh, machine in, <clears throat> in sequence, then basically you can improve it by up to an order of a magnitude. Uh, another thing is you will get an increase in the performance, because now you'll have less instances of failure recovery to deal with. So it'll be more performant. And finally, it will be easier on your pockets, and it's going to save you some money. So. The way that we choose to do the uh, prediction of like, uh, when a hard drive is going to fail, we use machine learning as our uh, predictor tool. And yeah. So to build any kind of machine learning model, there is one key ingredient that you need. And that is the data, right? So what kind of data can we use to learn like, what does failure mean? Like, what does uh, OK, healthy drive mean? So for this project, we use the smart metrics for our data. And these are essentially a set of attributes that tell you things like read error rate or temperature and so on and so forth. So it's sort of like the vitals of the hard drive. And you check the, kind of sort of check the pulse of the hard drive to say that whether it's OK or not. And the way that you can get these metrics is by using a tool called smart mon tools. So you can just install it by yum install smart mon tools or something. And basically how it works is you can just type smart cuddle and then the name of the device for which you want to get the smart metrics. So when you type that, when you run it, it's going to spit out a list of all the metrics. And that's going to tell you how the hard drive is doing. So that is the data that we use because uh, most of the modern hard drives expose this kind of data. So it's readily available. And more than that, uh, when you're training a machine learning model, you need like a lot of data. Like just using one or two instances is generally not enough when uh, training at least a supervised machine learning model. So the great thing about this 
was that someone out there had already done the hard work of collecting all of this data for their hard drives. So Backblaze is, um, I think, a cloud backup company that basically collected smart metrics data for their hard drives over a span of like six, seven years or so. And they put it in a very nice format, in a CSV format, and it sort of looks like this. So they have like the date for which they collected the metric, uh, the serial number of the hard drive, and then the list of all the <laughs> smart metrics. Uh, so that's great because they have it in a nice format and it's open source and it's readily available for use. And even more than that, what's really great about this is that it also comes with failure labels. So they took their data and in addition to the smart metrics, they also said that, hey, this is the day that the hard drive did not fail. So zero means it did not fail and one means that it failed. So if this hard drive with a serial number foo failed on January 3, then this will have a label one. So this is really useful because now it unlocks like a wide variety of uh, machine learning models that we can try in the supervised domain. So yeah, so that's the data set we, that we go with. Uh, so instead of using the raw data set, we use some, we tweak it a little bit and we pre-process it. So the first thing that we do is so if you notice here, there's only two kinds of labels, like zero and one, like fail or no fail, right? So even if I have the best model in the world that is like super accurate, uh, super precise, that can only tell me that my hard drive is gonna fail today. And that itself may not be super useful. It, you might make it work, but it won't make your life easier. Like imagine if a doctor tells you that, hey, you're gonna die today. Maybe at lunch, maybe at dinner, who knows? So that's, that's not very useful information. So instead of using like a zero one label, uh, a better way is to use a more fine, fine grained uh, labels. So you'll have uh, normal, that is like a hard drive has at least six weeks or more to live. Uh, then there's one called warning, which says that the hard drive is gonna fail within six weeks. So it's, it's not super urgent, but keep an eye on it. And then there's critical or bad, so that means that this hard drive is gonna fail very soon, uh, do something. And of course, if none of that work out, if the model fails to detect, uh, it's not gonna crash your system, it's gonna just say there's insufficient data or unknown output. So this is the format that uh, is more useful and also that's the way the Ceph ecosystem is set up for the disk prediction module. So that's why we decided to go with uh, this kind of labeling. So, <coughs> Let's see. So we take the original data that used to look like this, and then based on when the hard drive failed, like using this label and the date, we essentially uh, change the labels that we want to predict on. So we make this into warning, good or bad. So that becomes our raw data set that we feed. So this is great. Like we have our raw data set up and running. And now we want to uh, build a model on it. But as most data scientists, I think, will tell you that uh, you cannot just take the raw data and simply shove it into a model and train the model to do something with it. So the most of the hard work or the smart work lies in taking the data and making it into a form that, that is more meaningful to train on, that gives you meaningful outputs. And Another thing is that you want to uh, design a pipeline that can accommodate uh, training this kind of data. So in our use case, <clears throat> uh, let me show you the kind of training setup that we have. So there was a bunch of things that we have to consider uh, while setting up the training pipeline and the pre-processing pipeline. And some of these for this particular project were uh, the data set size. So the Backblaze company has been collecting their data for like a long time. And like approximately one year of data corresponds to roughly 10 gigabytes of CSVs. So if, you, if you're resource starved or, yeah, if you're resource starved, then this is not a great data set size to work with and it might give you problems. So you, you might still be able to do it, but it will be super slow and inefficient. 
So one way, and probably the most obvious way, to deal with this was to change the way that it is stored. So as it is, the backblaze data set comes as CSVs. And that is, that is prettier to look at, but it's not the most, the most efficient uh, storage format. So we convert it to Parquet. That's, that's for faster uh, read writes. And if you're using like a deep learning model, uh, like PyTorch or TensorFlow, then instead of uh, using Parquet or CSVs, you can use, you can just serialize the data and use like the dot PT for PyTorch and similarly uh, the, for TensorFlow as well. So essentially make sure that you can do the reads, writes, and efficiently. Another uh, thing that we had to do was because the data is so big, the compute power may or may not be enough, especially when you're working in Python and you have libraries like uh, Pandas. So a library like Pandas is mostly single core based, so that would not give you very efficient, like that would not be very efficient and it would take some time, especially when you have such a large data set. So we used a, uh, a library called Dask and that essentially takes your data and uh, all the tasks that you run on it, the pre-processing, the cleaning and everything, it essentially divides it into workers and runs it over all the cores of the system. And if you have multiple machines, you can also uh, schedule it to run over multiple machines. So that was a very important uh, design choice. And next, uh, perhaps the more important one is the class imbalance. So what I mean by this is in most systems, like failure or anomalies is probably not gonna happen as frequently as uh, things being okay. And while that's a good thing, like from the perspective of the world and society, et cetera, as a data scientist, that kind of annoys you a little bit because this means that you will not have enough data to show your model what failure means. So if I have a, a million uh, data points, maybe for failure for this case, you have maybe 100, 200, or something like that, uh, uh, drives with failure, and the rest of them are working okay. So it's gonna be highly uh, imbalanced and biased. So to deal with that, there's two main things that we can do. One is to downsample the abundant class. So if I have uh, 50 million working hard drives and only 10,000 failed hard drives, then what I'll do is out of the 50 million, I pick only a smaller subset, like maybe 10 million or so, that are well representative of all those 50 million data points. So that's one way to downsample the abundant class. And another way is to oversample the minority class. So, and this may or may not work for all models, but essentially you can uh, use uh, the same data point from the minority class again for each batch or something like that. So these two things were uh, what we did for the, downs uh, for the class imbalance. And finally, uh, something that has to do with metrics. So smart metrics, as it turns out, can be very manufacturer specific. So for instance, you can have a Seagate hard drive that exposes smart 51, let's say, but a Toshiba hard drive doesn't have that at all. So if your model uses only the smart 51 or something, then it will work only for Seagate and not for all the other manufacturers out there. Or maybe it is the case that uh, what one smart metric means for one manufacturer might mean something else for another manufacturer. So let's say smart 51 being at a value 50 means like a Seagate drive is doing great, like it's the best drive in the world, but the same value for a Toshiba hard drive, let's say, could mean that it's basically trying for help. So there's a lot of variation in the interpretation and definitions of smart metrics. So to deal with that, we thought because these metrics and because the data is so specific to the metrics, we, can all, we should also make the models specific to the manufacturers. So what I mean by that is basically we have one model to predict stuff for Seagate, one model for uh, Toshiba, one for HGST, and so on and so forth. And this is still kind of doable because there aren't as many manufacturers in the world. So, so that's, this is the design plan that we decided to go with. 
So at this point, uh, we have the pipeline sort of set up. And we want to take the data and start feeding it into the pipeline. So one of the most important parts of training the model is to featureize the data that you have. So first of all, you have to clean the data, because like, like in the wild, the data is going to have a lot of holes. It's going to have inconsistent values and things like that. So I'm sort of just hand waving it right now, but like that's a big chunk of the process of training a model. So you have to first clean the data set. Uh, once you have a clean data, uh, we selected only a small subset of the metrics to work with because there's a lot of smart metrics out there. And uh, so with that kind of high dimensions, it becomes very resource intensive to train the model. And even so, uh, even more than that, it becomes more difficult to find models to train on because uh, the, the concept of distance in high dimension is not very well defined for some metrics. So having a lot of features can be a problem. So that's why what we did was we read some previous research, we read on the internet about the uh, domain, uh, and we also looked at some of the analysis that Backblaze had done. And based on all of this information, we took a small subset of the features that we want to train on. So now, once we have the features, we want it to go beyond just using the features as is. So as it turned out in the Ceph uh, disk prediction uh, module, we have up to six days of, like exactly six days of data available at inference time. So we thought instead of looking at just today's data to predict the health, why not look at the sequence? Why not look at the whole six days of data and look at the behavior of how it changed over time? So we tried to characterize like, this behavior over the six days over time. So uh, essentially, for each time point, we have like a window. And we look at like, the six days before it. And we try to characterize how it was. So we look at the mean value over the last six days, the standard deviation of uh, the metric, and uh, the coefficient of variation. That's, that's sort of like just a ratio of the two. So instead of looking at just a metric, just a number, you look at the behavior of that number over a period of time. So now we have our clean data. We have downsampled the number of features. We have downsampled the data. And we have featureized all our metrics. And at this point, we are sort of at the stage where we can just start feeding it to different kinds of models and try to see how it does. So this part is what I think is the easiest part of um, uh, machine learning to actually fit the model. Because here is, so, so this doesn't involve that much uh, work from the data scientist side necessarily, because this is just something like from a library, you just call model.fit or something like that. So that's the easier part. So for this uh, particular task, we tried a bunch of models, starting with like the de facto or like the go-to models for this. So things like SVMs or decision trees and random forests. Uh, and then we also tried some fancier models that build beyond this. So something like a uh, XG boost, uh, gradient boosted decision tree. So it's like a tree, but fancier, made in a fancier way. Uh, we also slightly explored uh, deep learning techniques. So something called long short-term memory. And uh, yeah. But we didn't go too much deep into it. And in a minute, it'll become clear why. So with all our experiments, we found that what worked the best within what was possible was just a random forest. So a random forest is essentially a collection of decision trees. So, and a decision tree is essentially uh, a set of questions the model asks to arrive at a conclusion. So like, is smart metric 10 less than 5? Yes, then go here. Is smart metric 50 more than 70? Then go, yeah, go here. And then sort of trickles down into a decision. So that's, that's hence what is called a decision tree. And a collection of those is a random forest, which we found to, uh, to work the best with, the, with some limitations. So the limitation that I have been talking about 
that uh, what prevented us from trying other or going after more fancier uh, Python libraries and things like that is that at the end of the day, you want this model to be integrated upstream, right? You don't want it to just sit in some repository and sit there and look pretty. So the thing was with uh, upstream integration, not all Python packages work well for that. There's a limited set of packages that we can use to uh, build models that can easily integrate with what already exists in the Ceph ecosystem. So because of that, we didn't uh, experiment too much with uh, things like deep learning and so on, because it, it's a little bit more difficult to get it upstream. So within that realm, we found the random forest uh, things to work the best. And, oh, yeah, so one more thing is the results, at least from my uh, personal opinion, it's not something that is out of the world. It's definitely, it can definitely get better, but it outperforms the sample model that is already upstream. So it's already an improvement over what we already have. So that's, that's one key win. And another key win was that all of this, like all the data set, the model making and everything, is completely open source as opposed to the one that was, uh, the, as opposed to the one that is upstream, which is sort of like a black box to us. So with that said, uh, there's always scope for improvement on the results. So speaking of results, let's speak of results. So usually uh, when you have such an imbalanced uh, data set and an imbalanced problem of failure when you have one class dominating the data set and a very small percentage forming the rest of it, you cannot use accuracy directly as your uh, performance measure. So we use, uh, you use something other than that called recall and precision, which I'll get to in a minute. And so the recall is basically that of the data points or of the hard drives that were actually good or uh, that were actually bad, how many did my model correctly identify as being good or being bad? So in that respect, uh, we were pretty close to Profit Store and in some case uh, better than Profit Store. And yeah, so this is done on a subset of data that neither of the models has seen before. So it's, it's as fair as it can get with the data that is already available to us. So that was our metrics on this. And another metric that we used to evaluate the model was precision. So when my model says that, hey, this hard drive is gonna fail, then how likely is it that that hard drive is actually gonna fail? How precise is my model? So in that respect, uh, our models were almost always better than the profit store models, like you can see here. And in some cases, like uh, the warning class, it significantly outperformed the profit store models. And uh, the thing that is something to highlight here is that it works especially very good with uh, the warning and the, and the fail, the bad class. So essentially, uh, it does very well where it matters the most. So with that said, I wanna show a small demo on like, how you can get this set up on your Ceph cluster, how you can use a predictor model and uh, run it today. Uh, is this sort of visible to the, towards the back? Yeah? Oh. oh, yeah. The thing is, it won't, I don't think it will actually go full size. It'll just add the black. <laughs> but, oh well. What? Let's see. Oh, wow. Oh. Awesome. Contributions. <laughs> All right, so let's hope this goes away. All right, so here, um, so first thing I did was just clone the repo as is upstream. And uh, because I was testing it out on my local machine, I did not, obviously my local machine is not a Ceph cluster. So uh, Ceph comes with a utility called uh, vstart, and that essentially uh, builds a deployment fake cluster for you to test out your developments on. So the first 
a few lines is just me setting up the, uh, the fake cluster for testing. Just make their build and then make restart. So that's, that's all you have to do, just two lines of code. And then it's gonna go through uh, making it, but I'm not gonna go through it because it takes a very long time and this is a small talk. Uh, so once it's ready, you wanna <coughs> start the cluster locally. So for that, they also have a script called restart.sh, and we just have to call it, and that's gonna set up a local cluster for you to test on. So this also takes like a minute or two. But it's a super useful utility to have. I think you can skip this. Yeah. All right. Thank God for skip button. OK. So now we have uh, the local cluster set up for testing. And the first thing that we want to do is to enable the disk prediction module. So that's just self manager module enable, and that will enable the this prediction, whether it's profit store or whether you use these models. This is sort of a requirement for you to uh, set up. So once that is set up, you wanna, oh, you wanna type, yeah. All right, so Ceph has two kinds of uh, this prediction available. One is locally, so it uses the local models that it has uh, in the system to predict. And another one is cloud, so that essentially takes all these smart metrics and uh, sends it to a server, and then that server runs the prediction and gives you the result. Uh, the models that we made are only available locally and not on the cloud at the moment. So, so the first thing that you want to do is ensure that it's running the disk prediction locally. All right, so that's there. Okay, so once that's active. So the next thing that you wanna do is, although we're confident in the models, uh, we don't impose that on the user. So by default, the models that, gonna, that are gonna be used are the ones that are already upstream, the, the profit store models. But if you, should you want to change the models that you use, you can just uh, set a config variable in Ceph that is, uh, predictor underscore model. So we can set that model to Red Hat for the lack of a better name, we chose Red Hat. Um, and then once that is set, it's gonna use the models that we built and then use, predict, uh, use predictions from those. So, so that is pretty much all the setup that you need. So once you have that set up, you're free to run all the predictions and have fun with it. And the way to do that is so Ceph and then disk, is it disk predict or device life expectancy, life expectancy predict? And then the name of your device or the name of the hard drive that you wanna run the prediction on. So something like that. So in this particular instance, it did not give a very useful prediction, just as unknown. So you were already here, you're back where you started. But uh, I tried both the models and both the models give the same prediction, which is unknown. And maybe it's not so much interesting running it locally, but, but yeah, it's out there, you can do it and hope that it works. So that is the end of the demo. Uh, and if you're doing it locally on the uh, fake cluster, then you also have to do one additional step, which is to make sure that you shut down the cluster, unless it, otherwise it's gonna eat resources. So just a, it also has a script called stop.sh, just run it. And yeah, I think that was all for the model, uh, demo. Okay. All right, so as you probably saw, it's, it's a great model, but it's, not, it's definitely not the end goal that we wanna have, and in fact, as at least as I see it, it's more of a starting point from where you wanna go. And the goal of the project was to enable development on this and iterate again and again on the models. So let's talk about how you can contribute to this. So 
a core part of the project was a bunch of notebooks, Jupyter notebooks. And uh, if you're not familiar with these, it's, uh, it's a format in which you can run, in which you have these code blocks, which have Python code, along with some fancy outputs, uh, pictures, and things, and so, uh, things like that. So we have notebooks that are designed for every step of the training pipeline. So you have one for exploring the data, getting used to it, and getting a feel of what it's actually like. Uh, then there's a notebook for cleaning up the data, which is a very, or for, at least in this case, is a very hard thing to do. So there's a notebook for that, and then you, it, you can take the data, clean it, and then there's a notebook for pre-processing that clean data, and featureizing, extracting the features, and then feeding it to the model. And then finally, uh, there's also some notebooks uh, that uh, take all of this and put it into like one thing. Uh, even beyond that, we have something called a Kaggle-like setup. So uh, my colleague, Michael Clifford, took the effort of taking all of that notebooks and essentially packaging it very nicely into this, uh, this one Kaggle kernel. And essentially what that does is introduces the problem like very gently if you're a first user uh, and then tells you uh, very, like describes the problem, describes what kind of models you could use and uh, basically handholds and takes you through the entire process. So if you want to quickly go through this, there's like a nice description, uh, the feature selection and the missing data handling that we do in the repo uh, put very nicely in this. Uh, once you go through that. So like just making one function that does all of that previous steps for all other instances of the data set or, or other manufacturers. Uh, and once you have that, there's like some simple heuristics that he wrote and uh, that gives you, that helps you better understand the data and compare how machine learning models would have done against a simple prediction, like return one. So that's all of this part. Oh, and of course it has a lot of pretty graphs. It's there. <clears throat> and yeah, so finally uh, we compare the ML models with some simple heuristics and see how it does. So that's all up here in this uh, repository, and it helps you basically get set up with the problem and like the name suggests, getting started. And finally, if you're a deep learning enthusiast, or like me, uh, we also have made a, a set of tools, utilities, data set classes that essentially help you get set up with this problem, but in a deep learning context. So now it opens like a whole new door of things that you can try on. So uh, what this includes is like a set of tools to take the raw data set and make it into a format that is uh, better to work with PyTorch. So again, this is gonna be very PyTorch specific. That's probably because of personal bias. But at the moment, this is what's available. And uh, essentially it takes the data, makes it available in a format that's easier to use with PyTorch. And it, it has some data set classes that you can use for very easily loading data and then training model. So to give you a very brief uh, overview. So it's, so all you have to do is like from data sets import data set and then, <coughs> excuse me, uh, give it the path to where the data set is stored and it's gonna do the splitting and everything for you. And uh, yeah, and then in this line you define where, which data set you wanna use. So train data set equals this data set that I imported from here. And yeah, that's pretty much it that you need to load the data. And once you have this data loaded in like three lines of code, you can go ahead and define the model. And please don't define it like this. This is just a toy model. It'll do very poorly if you run it, if at all. Uh, so yeah, you can define the model uh, very simply. And then all you need to do is write a for loop, like for sequence in train loader, prediction is equals predict. So in like very few lines of code, you can get started with this problem in a deep learning context and go have fun with it. Uh, with that said, I do want to mention one thing. 
that because the data set is so highly biased, because there's like 99% data is of the successful or like working drives, and only 1% is of the failing drives, so deep learning models usually don't do very well on that kind of data, at least not when you use a very simplistic loss function. So this may or may not give you uh, great results if you use it as is with the default loss functions and everything. But uh, with this, basically, uh, you don't have to worry about getting the data and getting it set up. You can focus on things that matter more, I guess. So yeah, so whether you're a data scientist who wants to go deep into the problem, we have notebooks for that. Whether you're just getting started, we want an easy, to, like an easy path to the problem, we have those, the Kaggle kernel for that too. And if you're a deep learning person, we have that set up for you too. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about today. And yeah, I'll be happy to take any questions. Yes? So uh, I get quite a few of those papers on the book on it by my workplace. And the general gist of it, for, for me at least, is that SMART is a very bad predictor for mm -hmm. failure. It's mm -hmm. a very good uh, signal to tell you, yes, I already failed. I see. And uh, what I noticed uh, is a good predictor of failure mm -hmm. is when the performance of the is going down. Like a time for the, the like when the, when the drive requires uh, multiple times of detectional uh, delay, like if you have a 7,200 uh, uh, RPM drive, if it takes like 40 and then 21 or like 36 second, uh, milliseconds to hit a, a given uh, sector, and if that happens for multiple sectors, then you know that that drive really will fail in, in a soon. Uh, Soon, I see. Uh, if you, do you have any plans to add this kind of monitoring and also data for, for SAT so that it can have better prediction? Because like, uh, as, as you saw that, we are uh, around like 30% uh, yeah. failure rate for, for the prediction in terms of health. Yeah. So, sorry to interrupt, but I already have to second that because of what you said so far, that we've seen a lot of customer drives that before failure when they get really slow, like you have slow ops just on one OSD, and this is a very good indicator that the drive will fail. But we had a lot of cases where there was a no error seen in smart on the controller or somewhere, but still the drive yeah. was already quite slow. Yeah, so um, did everyone hear the question? It's kind of too long to repeat. Yeah, okay. So uh, to answer your question first, uh, I think, but I may be wrong, smart metrics do have one of the metrics that measures the spin rate. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's a metric that uh, measures how fast the, 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 the thing is spinning. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, so, I was giving the, the numbers just for an example. Like, uh, because yes. Normally, if you are hitting just sequentially, you will hit uh, get, uh, get blocks by blocks uh, in under a millisecond uh, time. But like, if, if, the, if the hard drive needs to uh, read the block again, because like the CRC correction failed or something like that, mm -hmm. then uh, you will see a, a multi-millisecond uh, delay when he hit that, that sector. So like that's, that's the predictor for like, yeah, the, the drive really has a problem reading the data because it doesn't simply give you the data. Oh, I see. So it, it, but can you say the last part again? It doesn't give you the data? Yeah, because yeah. like if you ask the this, uh -huh. To give you the data, yes. you are asking uh, a sector after a sector. Ah, I see, I see. You will get the sectors in like one millisecond, one millisecond, half a millisecond, millisecond, and so on. Yeah. But like, if, if it's the reading data. Okay, I get it. I get it. So, um, I don't think there is. So, at least uh, with this data set, I don't think they have that information. And I don't know if how you could get that metric. Essentially, because because I mean, so we are not doing the data collection can, itself. Can, uh, yes, get yes, I agree. Yeah, okay. uh, but the thing was, we didn't actually do the data collection part. We were using the data that people have already collected and open yeah, source. That's my question. So, do you plan to add that to the uh, Because, like, uh, from what I read in the, in the research, that yeah. would be a bit good predictor. Yes, uh, so I personally don't know if Ceph is planning on doing that. So I, I work in the um, AICOE, so I'm not necessarily on the Ceph team. So I, I don't know if they have plans to do that, but 
that is a very good suggestion, and I'll, I'll probably trickle up to the people. Yeah, uh, thank you. So uh, the question was, are you planning on adding uh, the number of LBAs written or number of uh, bytes written uh, as, a <clears throat> as a feature on the data set, right? So, uh, the, uh, the big is the other one. So basically, you've got the lifetime mm -hmm. value as documented by the vendor. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so we tried half of what you said. So we tried to look at, I think you're mentioning power on hours, right? That's the lifetime of the, or like how long the drive has been on for. So in one of the notebooks that I showed before, uh, we looked at that metric for failed versus uh, working drives, and we basically found no difference in like when they fail. In fact, like if, if you run one of the uh, notebooks, you'll see that most metrics, how they work is they're usually like doing okay, 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 and then suddenly they fail. So uh, we tried looking at that and we looked at the power on hours too, uh, but it did not provide any significant value. But that being said, we did not look at power on hours by day. So I'm trying to think if the model would. Uh, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, sure, just before uh, you, you go. Uh, so f about the LBA is written, right? So I think SMART 241 or something, that is exactly that number of LBA is written. Yeah, yeah. So that is already in, in the, yeah. yeah. But, but you don't feed in the uh, GBW, I assume, right? That was my point. 
Oh, yes. You know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not the ratio. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we do not do that. So uh, I'm obviously not the domain expert, so I didn't know if that'd be like okay to do or like what features should I be uh, taking ratio of or playing around with. So did not add that and just took uh, the metrics as is and featureized it. But yeah, maybe what you're doing could be a more powerful indicator. Yeah. And the second question? Uh, so this was essentially written as uh, a model to be used in, in the Ceph ecosystem, but at the end of the day, it's just a model. So it's just a serialized pickle file. So if you can run Python on the system that you want to use this on, then you can essentially, yeah. So you can take the model, feed it the same data that we are feeding, and if the data is same, then yeah, the model will work. So. Any other questions? Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Of course. Uh, for instance, in my career experience, right, you know, dying coincidentally without showing any issues before, like you had, for instance, a flaky port in a pilot, mm -hmm. and you had a split second power outage, and the firmware couldn't quite cope with it, and the device went offline and never came back after racing. You said that also. Uh, can you say the last part again, the last thing? Uh, yeah, the last thing was, you know, vendor information. Mm -hmm. That would involve, you know, like the partnership with the vendor allows, we have these kinds of, you know, storage outages, right? Mm -hmm. Power, great power, and it went offline, never came back, even though the physical media was intact. Right? I see. That kind of information needed oh. to be fed into the system also along the lines of, you know, TBW. So at the moment, because the models are manufacturer specific, uh, I'm not sure how you would feed. So, so that's already kind of metadata. That's already kind of like an assumption that the model has to do only with that manufacturer. So that should already be able to deal with what you're saying. Like if that happens specific to vendors, to manufacturers, then that model should be able to deal with that. Does that, does that make sense? Or? Uh, sure, yeah, I'll be happy to. Uh, so, I'm not sure. So, 
So there's two answers to your question. So one is, does it get uh, data, failure data from the customers? And the answer to that, I'm, again, not sure of, because I'm not sure what the uh, Ceph team is planning or if it is planning on collecting data from their instances. So I'm not sure if it gets from the customers. But as, long as, the, uh, as far as the retraining goes, yes, the models do need to be retrained. And there is no uh, automated way of doing that right now. Like, you're just required like, someone to uh, fetch new data from Black Backblaze every quarter and then retrain it. Yeah. Yeah. As, as technology moves on in the storage world, yeah. you get more data. Exactly. All right, any more questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you.